Pastor Joel Brooks, how are you doing? Doing excellent. Good to see how, you. It's good to see you. Uh, how's your How's your family? Everybody's doing well. Everybody's doing well. You know, um, my family has grown some. You know, I got eight kids total, right? Or did you, you Did you know that? I, I I didn't know you had eight kids. I, I think you uh, <laughs> you have some. Uh, when I it, well, see, it seems like the last time we talked, yeah, um, you had some little ones. Right. Yeah. Well, Elijah's the youngest. He's eleven. Okay. All right. He. He's our MD <laughs> for our band at church. He's amazing. He's really good. And um, then there's Preston. I don't know if you knew Preston or not, um, but Preston's um, he, he lives. He lives in another city. And then of course there's my three and Yvonne's three. And so, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, but everybody's healthy. Uh, no, everybody's healthy. Everybody's doing good. Yeah. That's good to hear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How are things uh, at your church? Things are good, man. We um, we've been anticipating this, um, not a virus, but we've been anticipating having to operate online. Um, mm -hmm. Back in '05, when Katrina happened, um, sixty churches ceased to exist. Okay. Uh, in other words, Katrina comes and there's 60 churches that are not anymore. That's what I heard. That was, that's not, you know, that was the, the word that I heard. And so I, I began to ask myself how we would fare in something where our building was unusable. And so, you know, when I thought about it, I, I think we would probably continue to exist, but I didn't give us a good grade. And so ever since then, and you know, one of my, one of my deals is the house of God, right? Okay. And so ever since then, I've been making preparations so that we could function. Everything you do at the church, you could do online, uh, except a hug and a, a handshake, which you can't do now anyway. <laughs> so, right. so yeah, no. So, so we've been preparing for this. I told them the week before it happened. I said, look, something happens where we can't use our building, we'll go right online. And so our small groups, our Zoom groups, our, um, we have a lobby experience. Everybody goes into the lobby before church. <laughs> then they then they uh, get ready for the message, and then we have an after an after thing in the lobby. And so, our groups, everybody's meeting by Zoom. Um, I had already. I don't know if you were aware of Salt uh, Stone. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so Salt is online. So everything we do is online. We're uh, we're cooking. I think we kind of have an introvert church. So I think most people are not. I'm not minding it, you know. But we're doing good. We're doing good. I, I um, there's more opportunities this way, you know. There's a lot more opportunities to reach people, and so I think the, ch the church has kind of been stuck in an old model that we needed. We needed a shakeup. So, yeah, doing good. All right, that's good to hear. Um, you, you're talking about. Uh, the church being an introvert church, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm an introverted. And, okay. uh, so this, you know, this whole thing, the, the biggest things, uh, that I miss are yeah. the gym, being able to go to the gym okay, and, yeah. Yeah. and, uh, and then gigs, you know, just uh, right. performing. I had a lot of stuff that got canceled. Uh, okay. thankfully, uh, the uh, I'm the minister of music at Second Baptist Church, which is uh, okay. uh, this church is about 184 years old in Columbus. Wow. Uh, the first minister of the church was an abolitionist, yeah. and uh, so it's got a lot of uh, a lot of history. It's the oldest church in Ohio, uh, the earliest wow. black uh, uh, the oldest black church in Ohio. Oh, and yeah. uh, first Baptist is probably the oldest. <laughs> <laughs> oh right, right, right. <laughs> well, well. well this can't be old, but go on. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, well, thankfully, we we've been, you know, reduced in a reduced uh, capacity. I mean, we have we're trying to do the ten or fewer people involved with this, but you know, right. we've been doing, still been doing church, but it's a it's a it's an online, it's a live service, but mm -hmm. you know, the congregation is not there. 
Right. Right. And uh, and then in addition to that, I've been able to maintain relationships um, at a church that uh, at a church that you uh, you were a character reference for me, and uh, you vouched for me, uh, Vineyard uh-huh. Columbus. Um, and oh, okay. I still have really good relationships there. I worked there mm-hmm. for five and a half years, and uh, um, so I still have really good relationships there, and so we've been doing what they've been doing is it's a, it's a mega church. So, mm-hmm. uh, they have the resources and everything to be able to, I mean, they were already doing some kind of an online service. Right. That and so they kind of, yeah. So they kind of expanded some of the things that they were doing and tweaked some things. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, they've been calling me to come in and play bass. Okay. Uh, for services. So a couple of these weekends I've been two places at once. Wow, um, and I, um, you know, I count, you know, I count my, I'm counting my blessings. You know, I try yeah. to think of where my head would be if I didn't have that, those performing outlets yeah. right now. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's something. Now, one of them is recorded. Yeah, one of the services is recorded, so it was recorded like on a Thursday, and then the other that's one is on yeah, Sunday. Vineyard. Yeah, that's that's, yeah, yeah, cool. yeah. So that's been uh, that's been very cool. Um, yeah. Now, you know, I was thinking about, you know, of course, how we met and everything. Right. And uh, it seems like I showed up to church one day. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then we talked, and you were like, "Bring your horn." Yeah. And then that was that was, <laughs> it. The, that was it. That was it. Um, I heard you. That was it, man. It was amazing. It's really good. Thank you. Well, I, I have to say, um, I so appreciate uh, the opportunity to work at Christian Life Center. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, when I was at your your church, it was the first time I felt like I had a pastor, really. Um, wow. Great, man. Well, thank you. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I, uh, I have a lot of fond memories, um, you know, mm-hmm. being at CLC, first the old building and then moving into the yeah uh, the new the new facility yeah we were having a good time yeah it was great it was great stuff and uh, um you know and i have to say it was a great opportunity to be able to develop and to de- develop a band and yeah. uh, to bring in folks uh students from western michigan university to yeah uh, supplement what it was that we were doing it was uh yeah. it's a very cool a nice thing. band yeah it was uh it was good times. Yeah. It was yeah. good times. It was, man. It really was. And then when I finished my master's degree, you all uh, made it easy for me to stay in Kalamazoo by offering me my first full-time position. Right. Sure did. Yeah. And uh, that was uh, that was beautiful. Yeah, um, it was. Uh, I, I uh, you know, one thing about you that's... Um, uh, that's somewhat unusual is that you, you're a fine musician. Um, in addition to being, uh, you know, a, a, you know, fine a pastor and preacher, yeah. and teacher, uh, you're, a, yeah, you're, you're a fine musician. And I think part of me being able to really feel home, mm-hmm. uh, at Christian Life Center, I know the church's name is different now. Yeah, um, I got you. Yeah, but Christian Life Center was, uh, you know, it was, you know, had a lot to do with, you know, you being a musician and kind of understanding, you know, the psychology of a musician right. um, and uh, being understanding um, in the ways that you were. And uh, so uh, I wanted to know, uh, know more about what got you playing music and okay. maybe like when you were growing up and yeah. uh you know when did you start playing keyboard when you know when did a light sort of shine on what you right. felt like you needed to be doing musically yeah i was always deeply moved by music um the whole the whole concept my dad bought an organ his mom was an organist church organist in kansas city kansas and so my dad bought an organ and 10 free lessons came with it hammond little spinet not the B3. I had to graduate to the B3. But um, 
And so I took lessons and what, what was happening is I was, uh, I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> and so I would memorize songs and, and look as if I was reading them in front of my teacher. And I'd be playing page three and looking at page one. And so <laughs> rather than buckle down on me and make me read, uh, she told, she told my dad, uh, uh, you probably wasting your time. You know, I was playing everything by ear. And so uh, I would have her play it first. And, and I really, one of the biggest regrets of my life now that I didn't learn how to do music. But, so I started playing, um, played some in church. My uncle owned a nightclub. And back then you had, um, uh, you had jam sessions, okay? Um, where, you know, uh, you could sit in. Nowadays it would be hard to sit in on, on a band, you know, they've got tight stuff arranged and all that. But back then you had songs that you played, jazz songs that you played and everybody knew them. And most of the structures were pretty, you know, uh, there wasn't a lot of wide variances between the structures of the song. Most of it was blues. And um, I lived kind of in a, in a um, what would you call it? A B3 strip, a B3 kind of an area where um, you play your own bass. Now Motown was different. You know, Motown's in Detroit and they obviously have bass players. But it seems like Pittsburgh through maybe Ohio and all that, I mean, you had a lot of guys kicking their own bass. I didn't know a lot of bass players. And so I grew up playing um, organ trio stuff, like Jimmy Smith, Jimmy McGriff, uh, Groove Holmes, and that kind of thing. And so, so I always played my own bass. And um, so we would sit in. So that's how I grew as a musician, is actually just playing in clubs. Never practiced much, practiced some at home. And like I said, these are, there's a lot of regrets there because there's a lot of stuff I wish I was better at now. Um, but um, but they, they kind of cultivated me. My uncle would let me in the club, you know, when I was 12, 13. And so I grew up playing um, pretty much jazz and blues um, as a young guy, okay? And then when I got in high school, I think I, I, I became a revolutionary. I was ready to blow the world up. So I quit playing music. Music was stupid, you know, music sports that was stupid man you know we're about to have a revolution and so i took a couple years off and then towards the end of high school i, did, I started playing again and i would play in church and play uh funk top 40 type funk stuff and so sly and all that okay went into college that continued and then i started playing jazz again in a trio it was a place here called the whistle stop kind of a bohemian type of place and uh, i played about let see, Thursday through, Tuesday through Thursday there. And then Friday and Saturday, I played top 40 and funk and, and, and stuff. And so, um, but that was my college life, man. I didn't really do well in school. And so I got off and went on the road. Um, there was a guy from around here, uh, Narada Michael Wallen. We were best friends at the time. And so he got me into a lot of fusion stuff. And um, he went away and started playing with, um, Let's see, he played with Weather Report for a while, and then he went to um, Maha Vishnu Orchestra, John McLaughlin, and he, he was the first one to tell me about Jocko Castorius. He had met Jocko mm. and, and, uh, and all these things. Michael, incredible drummer, man. Uh, he took, uh, he, he followed Billy Cobham in, the, in Maha Vishnu Orchestra, took me out there to uh, Queens, and I auditioned. I was playing with Junior Walker and the All-Stars, R&B, uh, juniors from Battle Creek. And so I got that gig. And then I went over to, um, to audition with the Mahavishnu Orchestra, which uh, was a stretch for me. Uh, I think the song we played was in 13. And so <laughs> <laughs> and I'm with no bass player, you know, usually in fusion, if you're in a really odd time, the bass player kind of holds the pattern. It kind of keeps everybody locked in. But this was out of this was without a bass player, so I was I was basically lost, man. And uh, so I came back. I was I still continued to travel with Junior, who was actually playing a, a whole lot more. And um, then I played in a couple local fusion bands. Um, let's see, one was 360 Degrees. That was an organ bass uh, band. Uh, and then I played in um, one called Hammer, which was a, a funk fusion type of thing we did all the herbie weather report stuff and uh and so um was doing that and then i got uh became a christian during a break i went to i went to work at general motors 
had always played in church, had always gone to church, had a real, what I thought was a sensitivity. And some guys kind of cornered me. I, I was um, I was studying with um, Maharishi, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. And he was the guru of uh, Santana and uh, John McLaughlin and all those guys. And I already had me hooked up with him. So I started studying, um, I started studying that stuff but I consider myself a Christian. So I sat at the Christian table and they saw all these Hindu books. <laughs> they saw all these Hindu books on the table and they cut into me, man, about having a personal relationship with God. And ultimately that resulted in me accepting Jesus as my savior. And uh, the rest is kind of history, man. I, 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 um, at that time we had sort of a secular, sacred approach to everything. And so, um, I gave away all my albums and stuff and quit playing and quit playing in clubs, quit playing all that. I would only play at church. My view for that has, has you know, obviously changed over the years. I have more of a kingdom view of, of, um, of Christianity where it's all his. There is no sacred, there is no secular, you know? And the sacred whole, the whole sacred thing came from us trying to put it in walls and keep it in walls. And that's not the way, that's not, you know, the pattern that I see in the Bible. So, but, I quit playing and then um, all the churches were after me as a church organist and I was really, I was really trying to get my walk solid. So I, I wasn't ready to be up front. And so I didn't, I didn't play in church for, for a long time. And then I started, I started playing again. And I think that's when you came around. And uh, I think that's how we developed. I think I asked you about bebop stuff. Oh yeah. <laughs> Remember that? And I said, yeah. I want to learn some bebop lines, man. And so, uh, that I think that cultivated a, a friendship between us, you know. But you guys, you guys were great, man. That was a great time when all those Western guys, you know, we had trombone and, and sax and trumpet, and we had everything. Man. We were, yeah. we were cooking. It was fun. But anyway, was, that's, that's my wonderful. music, Lenny. I've done some recording with Narada. Um, I did some recording with Junior Walker. I don't think it ever came out. So, yep. Um, so. Uh, transitioning to uh, become a pastor mm -hmm. and um, when did you when did you perceive a call yeah uh, and and then how did that uh, how did that sort of interface with the musicianship and just trying to integrate that into yeah what you were doing yeah I really be honest with you, I really didn't. Um, you know, I'm not sure how you look at the term religion, okay? But I I became religious, okay? I, I made some, I made some decisions that I really God wasn't requiring me to make, okay? Mm -hmm. And so, um, and so at that point, I really kind of dropped the music. And um, when I began to pick it up again, I don't know if you remember when the DX7 came out. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I began to pick up playing again. I bought me a DX7. And I had a, a drum machine and stuff like that. And Western Michigan had a Western Michigan University had a studio at the Dalton. I think it's at the Dalton Hall. Mm -hmm. And um, nobody was using it. Okay, nobody had an interest in the studio. Mm -hmm. And so the guy who ran it uh, knew of uh, uh, um, another one of the guys that was involved in the church, and we just went up there and recorded man, hours and hours and hours and just. Uh, now it's a hot spot, you know, now it's, you probably couldn't do that now. But you know, those opportunities, you get those little things that happen. And so, man, I was up at Western at the music school all the time, playing and my playing started getting crisp again, you know, it started getting good again. And um, I was in a tough marriage and uh, uh, my stuff wound up torn up. I mean, like just destroyed, you know. And that was, um, that was a real heartbreaker. So I pulled back from playing again. So I've kind of been in and out and in and out. And right now I've purchased some things. Um, Cause you know, when you go from church to church, the synthesizers or the, the keyboards can vary wildly. <laughs> you know? Oh yeah. <laughs> and so I'm trying to do some computer-based stuff. I bought, a, uh, I have um, Logic on my Apple stuff. Yeah, about yeah. native instruments and some artillery and stuff. So I'm trying to get used to, uh, to using uh, computer sound so that when I travel, because I, I do play when I travel, so that when I travel, I, um, I it's there's some consistency, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. But um, 
I've never really been all in the way I should be. And I think it's, it's I paid a price for it. I think you pay a physical price for not being creative. I think being creative is so important, you know? Well, it seems to me, though, that one way that um, we greatly benefited from uh, the music in your past and mm -hmm. in your present is uh, the way that music really dominated uh, the service at Christian yeah. Center. Yeah. Um, and I remember in particular Wednesday night services where the worship was extended and sometimes <laughs> you'd get up and talk for maybe 15 minutes because yeah. you just let us play for the whole service. Right. You know. Right. Right. And and what's what's funny about that, Sean, is that um that I've had people kind of outsiders, you know, or people who were there during that time. And um and they'll tell me, man, I've had this happen four or five times, okay? They'll tell me, you know what, Pastor, you know what was really special about the service? You know, because nowadays service services are shorter. People everybody's trying to be compact. And you're trying to get the fat out, right? And yeah. so uh, they come and tell me, they say, you know, we love the preaching. You know, we love the worship. But when you guys would just jam, so when you guys would just jam, that's when we really felt the anointing. And I'm like, I'm thinking that was the, that was just kind of a, a side piece of the service, you know? Right. And I'm, I'm telling you, man, I have, they told me time after time after time that when you guys just jam, you know, but in my mind, in my rational mind, I'm thinking, okay, that's the part we can cut out and save time, you know. And I'm thinking that's that's what that's where we are. That's where God really shows up in our service, and that we need to really get back to it. Just the improvisational, you know. There's one of the words for praise that just says the band just stops and jams, you know. <laughs> I can't remember which one it is, but it's. Um, um, I think God is a, a lot more has a lot more fun with stuff than we let him sometimes. So. Now you were talking about this, uh, what I consider to be a false dichotomy, sacred mm -hmm. versus secular. Yes. Uh, um, That's a good way to put it. I like it. Um, and now there was a purpose of so-called sacred music. Um, and there was something called sacred music and it wasn't um, in opposition to everything else. Right. Um, uh, it was liturgical music, right? So it right. had a particular function. Right. Um, and so there was liturgical music and then music that was not liturgical, right. but not considered to be lesser than. Okay, good, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, one thing that's interesting is we don't really see this sacred secular dichotomy until the Protestant Reformation. Okay. Um because in the early church it was a very simple uh, understanding of art and music whatever is beautiful glorifies God okay yeah mm -hmm. very simple I mean right. um, I uh, played uh, I played with the Columbus Jazz Orchestra and um, we had uh, Mavis Staples come oh, wow. okay. with us and she said to the audience this is something that she's said several times you know, uh -huh. the, de the devil doesn't have any music. Exactly. You know. Exactly. He uses it, but he doesn't have his own music. He can't yeah. create anything. There's no truth in it. And so all he can do is pervert, take things and, and pervert their purpose, pervert their use to use it for his means. But yeah, he he doesn't own anything. <laughs> he's a, he's an outlaw, man. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the way I look at that. It's yeah, funny but... because there's times when, like, say, um, when I when I'll be in a place and I did, and one time in, in particular where I, I didn't know I was going to preach, and uh, I usually like don't like to eat much before I preach. I like to kind of be, you know, and I hit I had eaten this big meal, man. Then I found out I had to <laughs> preach. And I'm like, oh man, I'm in trouble. And if I went I went home, I went to the hotel and played Cold Train. Mm. Okay. And it opened my heart up. Yeah. Now, most people would say, well, you play some religious music or something like that. But I play music based on the effect it has on me. And so it really opened my heart up and made it easier for me to hear. I know a lot of people have trouble with that. You know, they, don't, they have thoughts about Coltrane, but it was just the music. 
you know, the music was, um, it opened my heart, opened my mind up, man. And, uh, I was able to hear God and went and preached. We had a good time. Yeah, I mean, Coltrane was uh, intensely uh, spiritual and, 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 mm -hmm. and religious, you know. So, he was hungry, man. He was seeking, you know. Oh, that's, absolutely. That's, that's what opens me up about it. And uh, uh, one of his uh, one of his his works, one of his uh, most well known works, "A Love Supreme," mm -hmm. um, which is uh, dedicated to God. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very clear what the the topics are, and it's interesting because the names of the movements are sort of common names for sections of a litur liturgical service, right? You know. Right. A psalm is one, one of the movements. Right. Acknowledgement, it is. you know, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, one thing that was very cool is you now this seems like forever ago, but it was just back in February. Uh, but for Black History Month, um, I uh, structured the service uh, with the church I work at, the Baptist Church. I structured the service so that we could play in its entirety. Um, uninterrupted, the entire Love Supreme Suite. Oh, so wow. we played the entire four, four movements or something like that. It's four movements. Yeah, yeah. I wow. mean, uh, on the recording, it's thirty-five minutes or something like that. But yeah. we we got it down to like twenty-six minutes. Man, did you record it? Oh yeah, and it's on my YouTube channel. Okay, um, I'll check that out, man. I love that. There was a stretch when we were recording. Um, when you were soloing one time on one song and you and we hit that vibe, that same now I know preachers are gonna have go nuts over me saying this kind of stuff, but I you know, I've been doing this for a while. I know how to protect my spirit, I know how to protect my heart, you know. But where you were soloing and we got into that place, that, that mm -hmm. place that he gets into on um da, 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 da. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what what's that? Um uh, resolution. Ascension. Or? That's a resolution. That's resolution, the second. That's yeah. the second movement of. Uh, that's one of my most favorite stretches of music, man. That that's that piece there. They just go someplace with it, man. And um, and and we we hit that thing. When I listened to it, I think I might have interrupted it. But when, when I went back and listened, I said, man, we were in a place, a real place with that stuff. You know, everything, including the kingdom of God or music or uh, everything, has. Uh, what would you call it levels okay and i believe that that you can go you know depending on where you where you are um you can go to different levels and we had a level there that, that I, don't, I don't know if we really knew what we were doing man it was just good <laughs> it was it was it was cooking man it was just it was really intense you know and that's what i like i like anything that's even if it's slow and and um and quiet but it's still got to be intense for me. It's got to take me someplace, you know. So, uh, so before we started rolling, you you were asking me if um, about this quarantine interview series. Yeah. And yeah. I said I interviewed someone last night. Well, the person I interviewed last night is Antoine Roney. Okay. And Antoine Roney is the brother of Wallace Roney. And Wallace Roney is a great trumpet player. Oh, okay. Um, who passed away about a month ago from coronavirus. He's but, not the uh, guy that was with you. No, no. Okay. okay. Um, yeah. And, uh, wow. But, uh, um, I hate to hear that. Man. That's awful. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, it's, it, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty sad. I mean, it's super, it's super sad. He was in his fifties, you know, and yeah. he was, um, tremendously influential was, uh, like, um, uh, he really loved miles but he really okay, took yeah. aspects of Miles Davis's playing, especially chromaticism and in, uh, in closure. Um, and he really took that to the next sort of stage of development. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I, you know, I, I never, uh, I never played with Wallace. I think I met him maybe once, yeah. but um, I've known Antoine for a long time. He's a saxophone player. Okay. Um, and, he told me something in that interview that um, really kind of um, it was like a I, you know I, I thanked him for for 
I thanked him for telling me that. But apparently Wallace had one of my recordings. Okay. And he says that he found out about me because Wallace told him about me. Oh, wow. Okay. And, um, which was it's just like a, a strange thing. Yeah. But I was, I was saying that to say that, um, you know, Antoine played with uh, McCoy and with uh, Elvin Jones, you know. Wow. And um, when he was playing in Elvin's band, um, uh, you know, they would play some of the music, some of Coltrane's music. Yeah. And so he really uh kind of got really close to that. And we have Antoine and I have kind of similar influences. He yeah. talked a lot about Sonny Stitt, you yep. know, which was one of my um it was probably my first big hero. Yeah. Um and then um I I really couldn't So Coltrane <sighs> So the thing about Coltrane is I was he, I was listening to Coltrane when I was a kid and growing up and stuff cuz my dad right. hauled all those great records, you know, those Miles right. Davis records with just like the most incredible collection of musicians like ever assembled, you know? Right. Um, and, and I was hearing Coltrane, but I couldn't really, um, I couldn't digest Coltrane until I was in college. Really? Okay. And, uh, so, you know, when I started working at Christian Life Center, it seems like I was, um, I, I might've been a senior or junior or a senior, Right at uh, at Western Michigan University, yeah, and um, so and I think I so I think I worked there like a couple years as kind of like a part time band director, yeah, and yeah. then um, and then uh, when I finished my master's degree, then I went uh, full time, yeah. came, went to full time, yep. and uh, but during that time period, that that was during a time period where I was really a lot of Coltrane. There's yeah. a lot of Coltrane, a lot of studying right. Coltrane, dissecting stuff, trying to understand things, uh, really diving into like um, uh, his spirituality, like yeah. what it was that he was uh, after, not necessarily emulating all of that, but yeah. just trying to understand right. uh, where he was from. Because he kept kind of, at the end of his life, he kept kind of going back and forth between sort of Islam and Christianity and no one okay. is for sure. No one knows for sure if he was a professing Christian when he died, or right, right. you know, Muslim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a that's that's a that's a tough one. You know, you wish you could have talked to people and just you know shared your heart with them about that kind of stuff. Because you see a lot of guys out there struggling, you know, with okay, get, you know, kind of getting their bearings spiritually. Are you familiar with a band called Mint Condition? Oh yeah. Yeah. Have you ever heard them when uh, Stokely would go to the two drums, and they would just kind of, uh, just kind of jam out? Have you ever? You oh ever, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. To me, it's it's a bit of that vibe there. It's like they're reaching for a bit of that too. And the horn player, he's just you know, mm -hmm. rather than just playing lines or licks, he it's like he's really reaching. You know, it's like this, and that's that's what I love. Man, is the, is the risk the risky guys, who are not just dissonant for dissonance sake, but but who are really reaching. For a place, you know, to, to, yeah. it's almost to, to, to an emotional place or something like that. Um, you know, this that's that's an, I mean, that's a strange. One. I mean, men condition they're not known to be jazz players or nothing, but it's like they're reaching. It's it's, um, it's something. Well, but but a lot of those guys in that band, are, I mean, they well, they, they have a lot of history. Well, they have a lot of history as jazz players too. Okay, I mean, cool. um, yeah, they, you can tell. They can yeah, tell. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's one of the. It's one of the reasons why that. I, I love that band so much. Yeah. Um, yeah. Such a, such a killing band. And the thing also about Coltrane's music and his influence, it's mm -hmm. ubiquitous, you know, it's everywhere. It's in the water. Um, you you may not even say that a different way. What do you mean by that? Um, his influence is so far reaching. And, okay. um, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's so profound and so far reaching that even if you have never listened to Coltrane, yeah. you've been very influenced by Coltrane. Yeah. <laughs> even yeah. if you don't play jazz okay. and I'm just a pop, <laughs> I'm just a pop drummer. Okay. Yeah. You've been influenced by Coltrane. <laughs> you know, uh, I'd say it's only that influence is only second to Charlie Parker. Yeah. You know, yeah. It, it, I mean, it doesn't matter 
you know, if I'm a bebop player or not. I mean, I could okay. be a, a banjo player in a bluegrass right. band, and I've been influenced by Charlie Parker. Right, right. You know. Have you ever taught? Have you ever taught music history or jazz history? Or I mean, I, I you know, I teach uh, aspects of history in, in, as part of my applied lessons and improvisation and that kind of thing. I understand okay. history. I've studied history, but that's never been. Uh, a, a class in particular that I've that I've taught. Okay, yeah, I was um, listening to real jazz on mm. um, XM. Yeah, and I think I think Winton used to have a class on Saturdays or something, something uh, the hot seat or something. I don't know. I can't remember what he called it. But man, I fell in love with that. He would talk about the guys and the history, and maybe have somebody on to play with him or something. That was just a great. I was a great show, and I was wondering if you'd ever. If you'd ever done that, I'm thinking something that you're hitting on is is the whole minstrel piece, um, minstrel versus musician. Uh, I believe there's guys who play who play really well. I believe there's other guys who shift atmospheres when they play, and um, there's a place where the guy said uh, they needed a word from the Lord, man, and he said, "Well, go get me a minstrel." And the guy started playing, and he went right into the spirit and then began to prophesy. And so I think when you're talking about a Jimi Hendrix or Coltrane or these guys, you're talking about guys who actually had a, a, a thing on them from God that made them, you would call a minstrel, who actually would shift the atmosphere when they, when they would play. It wouldn't just play. And you say, man, that guy can play. It was like it had, it had an effect man, on the room, and it opened some things up, you know. And so, and so I'm really... I'm really, I'm really sensitive to that. Like, I don't, I don't know the, the scales and stuff I should know. And I regret that stuff. So it's not like I'm against it, but, um, but I know how to shift an atmosphere. You know, well, a few, to... a, a few yeah. years ago, I don't mean to, to cut you off, but a few years no, ago no. you asked me and you've asked me a couple times every like few years or something. You, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I'll get like a message from you out of the blue and you'll be like, Hey man, you have some jazz materials. You have some, you know, Learning some scales stuff, yeah. or something. I can, you know, yeah. every once in a while. Yeah. And um, uh, and I think the last time you asked me was a, I don't know, th it was a few. It was like three years ago or something, or four yeah. years ago. And um, and I said, well, I've got a book coming out. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, so that book has been out since September two thousand eighteen. And, um, it's a, I mean, it's an, imp I mean, that's what it is. It's called how to, how to improvise a record changes. Wow. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'm yep. going to send you, I'm going to send you a copy. Yeah. I've been, um, I've been wanting it on Kindle. Is it on Kindle yet? It, it, it's, uh, it's Hal Leonard and I mean, some oh, Hal okay. Leonard books are Kindle and yeah. they, it has to be in the contract. There's a bunch of there's a bunch of specifics to that but you're not the first person that's asked me that but yeah. uh this is not but it's not in that format it's just a it's a um a paperback a a paperback okay yeah. i'll get it man um i just I, I i probably need to learn how to read will it make sense to me if i don't know how to read i i think what'll make sense um y yeah i mean I need maybe to learn how to read. maybe yeah, well, do yeah, I I would do it in conjunction with that, but the okay, but the cool. concepts, um, it's I mean, um, I think the reading f for a lot of the exercises, especially in the first few chapters, yeah, um, I mean, you need to be able to read, but it's not like, yeah. um, um, it's not like comp complicated reading. Okay. It's it's just it yeah, it's just yeah. enough to sort of show what the concepts are. Okay, cool. And lay out the exercises. And the other thing is, you know, I can always um play some of the exercises and like right. send you videos. Right, okay. Yeah. And be like, here this is page thirty seven, check yeah. this out, you know. It's funny because, you know, I'm and certain things I'm really good at. I mean, there's other things that seem real difficult for me. The reading part just seemed really, I don't know if I'm like stuck in a kind of a way of thinking or something. 
but the reading always was a little was a little tough for me. I mean, I you know, college was tough for me, period. And um, and I'm not sure what's going on with that. But um, yeah, man, any help I can get, I'll get the book, and then um, we can do the exercise piece. You know, it just takes me a while to get a new concept. Now, what I get once I get a new concept, I can see into it. I can turn it inside out. I can, you know, I can do all that. But getting it, getting a new concept sometimes is is interesting for me. Um, another reason I want to do it is I have Elijah here, man. He's 11. I want him to know this stuff. He's amazing, man. He can chord and do all this stuff. And um, so I want to get him on fire, you know, for, for going to the next level with his stuff. So. Yeah, you, you sent me a message asking about um, uh, chords. some yeah, chords and things. I, I have a system. Um, okay. And uh, we we can talk about that also, but I you know I yep. I would do whatever you you want and help in any way it, you'd I like can, me to. I consider you a great source, so I'm going I'm be hitting you up. So we'll we'll, we'll get <laughs> together you. on that stuff, okay? So so I want to I want to ask you about you know one vivid memory. It's a mm-hmm. collection of memories, right? But one vivid, vivid memory I had from being at C- CLC mm-hmm. was in 2001, 9-11. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, the Trade Center. And, um, and the way that you provided a particular context for what mm-hmm. was going on. Okay. Okay. Um, and really filled everyone with hope in a really dark circumstance Mm -hmm. really filled me with hope Mm -hmm. in a really dark circumstance and um uh and when i was thinking of a pastor that i'd like to interview to provide somewhat of a pastoral perspective on what we're going through in the world Mm -hmm. today um you're the first person that i thought thought of because I remember, um, I just remember how profound, I, I, I remember, it's like I can, um, I don't have a lot of vivid memories, um, yeah. but the ones that I do have, um, often they're like out of body memories. Wow. So I was in my body <laughs> when it happened, right. but when I remember it, it's like okay. as if I am outside of my body viewing right. a scene. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I just there's some really vivid scenes. I'm I'm behind you, and you're at the pulpit, and you're um, and you're providing context for, you know, what happened um, uh, in that tragedy. Mm-hmm. Uh, so anyhow, I just I just I'm I'm curious about your thoughts. About, about what's going on, right? Yeah, I um. Well, there's there's two sides to what I'm thinking. I'm thinking about the, the things that are being forced on our society right now, which were going to come anyway. I didn't think they were going to come this fast. Okay, and then the the tragedy, the the you know, the awful things. People are people are dying, man, and it's it's a virus. Okay, um, and so. I believe I don't believe God's behind it. Okay, I don't believe God's doing it. Uh, I believe um, we are harvesting our ways. I think the world is a really, really crazy place right now, and we've gotten used to it. Um, you know, so you're going to get into some of my belief system. I'm I'm passionate anti-abortion. Okay, um, you know, I me too. <laughs> me too. You know, and and so, but we've gotten used to it, man. It's not a big deal. Uh, we're in a nation that, on one hand, has an uh, an employment problem. We can't fill these high tech jobs. There's a lot of jobs in certain streams that we can't fill. Uh, but we've killed seventy million babies. You know, twenty five million maybe that are black, and uh, we undereducate whole zip codes of people, okay? And, but the solution to that job problem is immigration. And so it's like, you know what I'm saying? Like you undereducate people, you get rid of people, and then you wanna bring people in. And so, um, and so I think, I don't think that's something, okay, let me, let me say it this way. 
You know, how do we ask God to protect us when we won't protect the unborn? Okay, so what are you, what are you standing on? You know what I'm saying? You know, you tell me to come down to Columbus to help you with stuff, and your wife tells me you're not even feeding your kid. <laughs> and I'm like, I ain't helping you with nothing. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, but you, 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 you're missing some basic stuff, you know? Um, our, schools just, our school system is designed to take God out of our consciousness. Okay, it's not a mistake. It's not a separation of church and state. It is designed uh, to remove the image of God from, from the consciousness of our children. And so uh, that's purposeful and we pay for it. You know, it's not as if, it, it, I mean, and, and um, I mean, that's just obscene that we've allowed that to happen as Christians, man. That's, that's fighting stuff, you know? And so, you know, our kids care more about plastic bottles than they do about unborn babies. You know, I put a post up one time. I said, you know, because, you know, there's an issue with black uh, black guys getting shot by the police. And so uh, I put in a I, I put a question on, on Facebook. I said, you know, what's the most dangerous place for a black male on earth or a black male on earth? OK, did you see it? And I'm, and I'm like uh, in the hands of his local police, in the streets of his local neighborhood in the womb of his mother, mm -hmm. you know, and, and almost nobody got it right. And hands down, it's in the womb of his mother. I mean, it's not even close. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, the figures are just yeah. Yeah. cancer, yeah. AIDS, suicide. I mean, all of them together still don't even come close, but we're used to it. You know, it's like, like it's, yeah, it's cool. You know, I believe uh, people should have choice and I'm like, man, come on. So, and so, so I believe that, that, um, if we're going, you know, it's like a, it's like a 12 year old kid. Okay. One of those, uh, Dr. Phil kids. Okay. He's, he's breaking stuff, man. He's cussing the parents out. You know, he got the whole household messed up and he finally like, you know what, man, I'm out of here. I'm gone. I'm leaving. You know, and he packs a couple outfits and, and some snacks and stuff and he, and he takes off. The snacks runs out, the snacks run out, he's hungry, um, it's getting cold, and everybody's looking real dangerous right now. It's like, man, this <laughs> that wasn't a good decision, you know. So he goes back home. And so so but now how does he come back home? Okay, I'm gonna come back. I'm, now I'm still gonna break stuff and cuss y'all out, but I realize I can't live without you. You know, we're gonna renegotiate. See what I'm saying? And so uh, now you're going to come back in and, you, and you're going to submit. That's what you're going to do. Okay. And so I think we realize we can't live without God. You know, we're printing money. <clears throat> you're not going to be able to print your way out of this. Okay. On one hand, the economy uh, stands to fail, totally fail. And I don't, I, don't, I don't think people in America know what that looks like. That's third world stuff, man. Yeah. On the other hand, people are dying from the virus. See what I'm saying? So we're in we're in something that we can't we can't solve. You know, this is this is this is epic. <laughs> this is time for the, the president to come out and say, man, I don't know what to do. I think we need to pray. <laughs> and I think and I think we need to consider some things. I, um are you familiar with David Wilkerson? I know the name, but yeah, maybe remind yeah. me. Well, he came, he came out, um, he, he, he gave a prophetic word back before he passed. Uh, I think he, he was pastor of Times Square Church in New York. And, okay, uh, that's, that's why, okay, that's why I know his name. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And he said there's a virus coming, a pandemic, and when it comes, it's going to come at the same time a third, the third great awakening is going to happen. And so I think out of this is going to be a mass revival, but, but we're so hardened uh, I think it takes something like this to, to cause people to say, hey, man, whatever, God, whatever you want us to do, we'll do it. And and I believe uh, I believe at some point a revival is going to break out. Um, I stopped having church, um, um, and it was a step up for us. All of our numbers have gone up, okay, um, financially, everything. Um, I thought, I've been thinking that was coming to church and to education eventually, okay, 
um, because it's just, you know, the, the biggest hotel chain in the country has no buildings. You know, the biggest cab company has no cars. Uh, the biggest merchandiser has no stores. Uh, you know, um, the biggest uh, photograph company takes no pictures. The biggest media company generates no media. Okay, so things have shifted and everybody has made the change except school and church. Okay, everybody has turned the corner except those two. And um, I mean, it cost, the cost to go to college is ridiculous, man, compared, yeah. to, compared to what it actually does for you, you know, besides give you credentials. You know, I mean, it's important in getting a job. But I mean, you can do this same thing a lot cheaper. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No, you know, I, uh, of, of course, I'm, uh, I have a dog in this fight, so to speak. Yeah, but oh, actually, time. but my yeah. my position on this issue is actually um, not the position I'm supposed to have. Um, well, I am, uh, and I'm I'm a tenured professor, so I can talk like this, right? Yeah, you you you're, you're an educator. Yeah. <laughs> my job is secure, uh, yeah. but I actually have serious questions about, um, you know education system period oh, first f first of oh. all i i don't fundamentally i don't believe that education is a right or it should be treated as a right i think it's a um i think it's a blessing it's a privilege it's by yeah. grace that we are in a situation where we can mm -hmm. uh, because you see all these situations um you know in uh high schools middle schools and high schools primarily mm -hmm. where you right. have students that really want to learn right uh sitting right next to someone that is never going to learn and is trying to do everything that they can to prevent other people in the classroom learning other kids yep. in the classroom learning yep and i think it's uh this whole concept and idea that you know everybody this is everybody's right what it does is it it creates these scenarios where we're trying to protect the rights of someone that doesn't even want to learn Right. <laughs> over the person that's sitting yeah. in the classroom that really wants to learn. Right. Um, and, and further, uh, it seems like the solution for these problems is always let's put more money into it. Let's give more money. And or uh, let's fight against anything that provides a better option for, for people that want their kids to have a better situation. Let's Absolutely. try to fight against those. And if yeah. you push against that stuff if you right. say look um i want my kid to have these other options i mean my son's in private school and he's going to be in private school as long as possible yeah uh he's in a christian school now messiah christian school and yeah. we're looking to put him in catholic school he's probably going to be in catholic school probably all the way until he gets to high school or something and yeah. unless uh unless there's a reason specific reason for him to be in public school maybe sports or something he's just going to be in private school because the stuff that's going on in, uh, in the school system, right. just, just from an, an aptitude perspective, that's, uh, that's, that's a hot mess. And then, um, a lot of the stuff that they're having these, uh, detailed, intimate conversations with your kid, what <laughs> with, with yeah. kids about that, they yeah. shouldn't be the people talking to kids about that stuff and without you present right yeah so i have yeah. a lot i have a lot of issues with that and i i think yeah. in general um we should we should offer more trade trade opportunities to be trained in trades that's another um, issue yeah uh, and and then in universities i mean we're charging all this money and we're cranking out all these kids you know with these educations but basically I think what our universities have turned into is basically an extension of high school because everybody's expected to go to college you yeah. know, in some way. Yeah. And, uh, um, yeah. And, <laughs> and, and, yeah. See, there's a, there's a functional thing. Then there, there's a, there's a spiritual piece. Like say, for instance, there, I, I heard a guy complaining yesterday about us not being able to go back to church and he's just going to go, you know, as of this date, I'm going back. And then he stops and he says, I don't know, I'm not sure if he heard it. So now we're reaching more people. 
<laughs> I'm like, okay, you know, we're doing good, but we're going back to, to that. And so, and, and, and so I have a problem with that, but then with education, it's designed to hurt your kid. If you believe, if you believe the Bible is right, then they're wrong. Okay. And it's designed in my mind to mess them up. You see what I'm saying? There's certain things you shouldn't be thinking about at certain ages. There's certain things that should never be okay, even if you do it. Okay. There's certain things that should never be okay. And so, and, and, and so they think that your kids are theirs and they can do what they want to with them. See, and so I can't even, I can't even drop Elijah off at school, man. He's homeschooled. I can't, um, and, and fortunately enough, um, Yvonne is a teacher. So she's a really good teacher, so she can pull it off. I don't think everybody can pull off homeschool. Yeah. But, um, well, everybody's pulling it off right now. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> that's, what I'm, that's what I'm saying. Is that, is that, that's where it is. And so everybody's saying back to normal. Okay, back to asking my kid what gender he is. Is that what you're talking about? Back to that. Okay, you, we're asking God to help us with that. <laughs> And I'm like, you know, because I believe the, the the passive wrath of God is He just lets you have your way, and eventually you, like the twelve year old, you'll be lost, and then you cry for help, and He come in and he'll help you. I don't believe He's behind evil, um, but 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 school, you know, would you rather hear? Would you rather hear a lecture by Herbie Hancock on video, or by a graduate assistant live? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I get that. You get it, okay, okay, and so, yeah. and so, in the future, there's going to be a lot fewer teachers. There's going to be a lot fewer professors. This, I mean, this thing is going this way just because of the expense of it, because somebody's going to offer this, and it's going to be disrupted. Okay. So they're going to say, "Let's go to uh, this university. Here's your faculty, okay, Herbie, uh, <laughs> you know, Jack Dejanet." Um, these are the guys you're going to be learning to. You can ask them questions by text. You can do these kinds of things. And, um, um, or you can pay $40,000 a year. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and go down here and hear some cat, man, you know, who's good, you know, but, but what's your, what's, what's your choice going to be? See, and actually you're way ahead of it, you know, cause you, you are on the internet, man. And so the internet changed everything you know we, we, we deal with time and space the internet took the space out of it man ain't no space no more <laughs> i was talking to a guy and, and um he was talking about well when this thing is over man joel i want to have you back at my church i said man you can have me at your church tonight and more people will 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 be in what we're doing than if i came down there he lives in cincinnati i said man i gotta get on a plane uh I got to leave my house, man. I got to go to a hotel. You got to pay for a hotel for me. You know, we might get 100 people at a Wednesday night service. Or you could just splash it. If you splashed it right now, hey, Joel and I were praying, and we, we decided we got to do something tonight. So tonight is 7, man. It's on. Come on, live. You're going to get 1,000 people, man, which may not never come to your church, see? And so... And so this is something that, that in some ways, I hate people dying, man, and people out of work, but it needed to happen to wake people up out, out of how we do things, man. Because I've been telling my people, I say, if you drive a truck, work on something else because they're going to be driving themselves, okay? If you are a teacher, lead the change. Invent the next way we do education because this is over. This, this is going to be done. Okay, you're not gonna do this the way you've been doing it. Quit asking for more money, because they're trying to get rid of you. <laughs> they they ain't looking at giving you a raise. They're looking at doing this thing without you. Okay, and there're gonna be fewer professors. There're gonna be fewer. You know, uh, people are not gonna be living on campus. I mean, right now, man, this thing just threw every university into a tizzy. You know. And uh, I have people, you know, you know how our church is. We have people that work up there. And I'm telling them, design the next one, man. You know, design something 
that requires no classroom, that requires none of this to take it to your department head or take it to your president and say, look, whether the kids come back or not, our department is set. We're, we're ready to do what we do. And if people want to come back, we're here. If people want to go online, we're here. Because what they haven't quantified is the fear of people getting back into things. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, you know, I've, you know do dozens of artists that I've interviewed, and in, when we talk about, you know, what is this thing going to be like post pandemic? Yep. Yep. Uh, it's not likely to be the same again. It's not nope. going to be, it's, it's not, uh, and, and if you consider um, artists that they tour, you know, they tour the world playing with orchestras, yep. you know, um, that that's, it's a big hall, it's a lot of people on stage, mm -hmm. 5,000 people in the, in the audience. I mean, mm -hmm. how many of these concert halls do you think we're going to be able to, to fill up just out of fear that people are going to have? Fear. Uh, let alone that yeah. certain styles of music tend to be patronized more by elder, elderly people, which are okay. particularly at risk. Right, that's um, true. I didn't think about that. Yeah, that's true. And um, and often, uh, you know, older people are the ones that have enough money to be able to afford to go to some of these kind of concerts, too. There's yeah. that, that factor yeah. also. But yeah. um, so you have that kind of thing. I do think that... <clears throat> um, now, for, first of all, all of the technology that we've been using to sort of get ourselves through what's going on right now, this yeah. technology already existed. Yeah. And, um, Absolutely. And, it's, and it's actually been technology um, in a, a model of deployment uh, that's been available, but that has been heavily resisted. Yep by many many institutions exactly now i'm not trying to toot my own horn or anything but yeah. i have a particular perspective on it since it was content that i was i was creating um yeah. i started generating online content back in 2005 yeah. regularly created content and right. uh, was the only in the school of music that i work at i was the only person the first that was actually publishing lectures lessons and other materials on itunes u you itunes go. u has existed for a long time and in yeah. many institutions around the country actually especially in lecture style courses were right. were actually publishing to that platform so yeah. this stuff has already existed for a long time but i think the powers that be they don't want that to totally take over no. um because uh, I think there's a lot of fear of, honestly, there's fear of technology and of change. Yeah, you, you mentioned some things, man, that, um, and one of, one of the things I teach on is systems, okay? And, and every organization eventually exists to exist, okay? They start out with a purpose. This is what we want to do, okay? And then there becomes other ways of doing this. And so now their purpose is survival. Okay, how do we... How do we stay relevant and how do we keep control over these things because we don't really want competition this competition may kill us i mean you know today is the enemy of, of tomorrow you, you understand what i'm saying right and so that's one of the, that's one of the things that that you deal with is that it's resisted until it, it just it just doesn't make any sense anymore see yeah. and so and so the thing is, my, what I'm telling people is like what you're doing, man, get ahead of the curve, Re create the future. And that's what musicians need to do right now, man, because they've been marginalized and they've been, there's been a process of marginalizing musicians for quite a while now, okay? You move from um, tapes and vinyl to CD. Now CD can be reproduced without any uh, degeneration, right? So that hurt us, okay? And then you move to uh, to um, um, transportable media. Yeah, M M MP3. MP3s, yeah. And now streaming. Yeah. Pennies, you know, fractions of pennies, <laughs> you know, per listen. And, and now everybody's got to work again, man. It's like, shoot, man, what, what happened to the royalties, you know? And um, so now everybody was out there gigging, gigging real hard, and then the virus. Right. See, and, and so. It was like, man, we got to find a new way 
a new way to do this, uh, you know, and, and, um, you know, hopefully things will get back to where this guy would just be devastated if you couldn't go to the symphony or go hear dad's concert or something like that. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's going to happen. They're gone. You were, you were saying something. You know, it's, uh, there are a few things that I think you cannot recreate virtually. Oh, absolutely. Um, so absolutely. one of one of them in a teacher-student relationship, especially when we're talking about music, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's so much of it that it's possible to uh, deploy content yeah. and and give specific instruction about, hey, I want you to be able to play this at this tempo in all keys, mm -hmm. upload a video, send it to me. I mean, you can do those kinds of things, but as far right. as like the conversational aspect of music, it right. makes it very challenging because the technology is not quite ready for that. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and even if it wasn't, uh, matter matters. So the physical world is not just... Um, um, the physical world is not unnecessary. It's, All it's, right, yeah. you know, yeah. so, so the whole having proximity to other people and even in terms of sensing vibration and, um, yeah. you know, being in the same space and the way that the sound travels and bounces off things and mm -hmm. all, generating all of that stuff that you feel, uh, within a certain proximity of folks. Yeah. Um, th things like, um, uh, you know, big band rehearsal or combo rehearsals, you yeah. know, uh, where you have a coach that's, you know, that's <laughs> with the group, all of that kind of stuff. It's, it's going to be hard to find a way, I think, to recreate some of that. But, but other than uh, those kinds of things that require really sort of nuanced uh, communication, yeah. um, you know, lecture style courses in, uh, you know, these math classes that have 500 kids in them, you know, <laughs> all of that stuff can be done online without uh, too much of it, too much trouble. I think I think what's going to happen, because what you're talking about is what I call lab. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, I call that lab. OK, you give me the content, but then I got to work with this. I got to work this stuff out. I got to get hands on. And so. What are we going to do about labs? And so what I think is a is a large chunk of stuff is going to be virtual, but it's going to bring the lab requirement is going to bring things back to regional, back to local. I think that, uh, and what you're going to have is, is you're going to have um, like the stores. I still go to stores. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I still I still use hotels. I still I prefer hotels to uh, Airbnb. OK, um, but what I'm saying is that it's disruptive. It's not going to replace it. OK, I don't believe virtual is going to replace actual. I believe virtual is going to seriously disrupt actual. Yeah. OK, see, and so I'm online. But who do I who do I want to have a relationship with? OK, well, I want to have a relationship with Thunder. OK, so that means that I may spend a month of my year down in Columbus. See what I'm saying? And you will you will design your piece so that I can. Okay, it won't be, hey man, come find yourself a place. All the, you know, colleges are real arrogant, man. You know, it's like, no. I have I have my own thing. I have my own building. You know, I have my dorms. I have a relationship with this hotel or something where you guys come down and we have a saturation where we where I, I will saturate you for 30 days or something. And so, so I'm not saying that there won't be normal school. I'm just right, saying. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I'm just saying they'll be struggling to survive. <laughs> you yeah, see? yeah. And only the best ones will survive. And so, you know, there's still stores, but there's not Sears, you yeah. know. <laughs> and so that's what I mean by it. it won't replace it. I mean, obviously you can't replace the real stuff with the virtual. But because they've scaled this thing so big, you can't replace a lot of it. You yeah. know what I'm saying? You got 500 people in the math class. I got people who say, I don't, I don't want to go to church and see a screen. I'm like, you already do. You know, you got 3,000 people in a building, man. You're not looking at that ant up there on stage. 
you're already looking at the screen. You Things have changed, and you think because you're breathing the same air with the guy that somehow you're having a, a personal experience with the guy, and you're not. You, you understand what I'm saying? What we're seeing right now with a lot of churches, I think, that are doing okay, um, maybe they already had the technology, and they are, were already sort of... Um, sort of trying to deal with that issue uh the issue of not enough connection between the pastor and the in the laity um and trying to do small groups and different things i think for those kinds of churches i think that this uh i think that this is what's happening right now actually might actually be better uh in some ways yeah uh but for churches that are more uh, closely aligned with, uh, you know, liturgical sort of churches, right? Um, where there's more emphasis on um, uh, the actual space, you know, there's more emphasis on the stuff that's in the space, you know. You're talking about the church building. Well, yeah, the church, the, the the church building, but it's not just the building; it's the, you know, it's the icons, it's. Um, it's the smells that are in the facility. It's uh, it's the interaction, the sort of call and response between the priest and the in the congregation. It's it's this sort of interwoven, um, you know, everything set to a tone, and all of that inter interaction and in intricate stuff. Yeah. So that's um, so I think it's it's more challenging. I mean, you know this because I we we just we talked about this before. I'm I'm Orthodox, right? And uh, basically, once this thing went down, uh, you know that put the kibosh on all communion. So it's you know so no communion, no, and that's something that has been the central function the central function of of uh, l the liturgy it's always everything is aiming towards that moment of uh of communion um, right. and so and that's been that way for thousands of years right so yep. to have this period of time is really unprecedented where you know all these church ju jurisdictions are saying well it's 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 too dangerous to to continue on i mean we didn't even do we didn't even do what's happening right now that didn't even happen during like the sars stuff yeah you know or um earlier on we had a or polio <laughs> like oh, yeah. you know during yeah. polio they were still taking you know they were still do, doing communion but so right. this thing is like uh really uh it really has changed so much stuff like overnight and it's hard to imagine how things are going to be able to totally recover. You got a problem as a musician right now. Okay, how do we solve it? What's, there's a solution to this. There's a whole new way of thinking about this that we don't know. Who's going to access it? Who's going to tap into it? You understand what I'm saying? Rather than say, man, how do we get back? We may never get back. Just logistically. Yeah, I don't think I don't think that there's much likelihood of us getting back yeah, exactly but, to the way that things yeah, were. But there's something better and we can't even imagine now, like, what could be better than what we had? There's a lot. You understand what I'm saying? Well, at least it's going to be something different, and we have to be willing to um, accept that and, yeah. and make yeah. adjustments. So I look at this thing quite a bit different. You know, I'm challenged. I mean, you know, fortunately we were already online but it's still beyond that. It's beyond that. But we need to know who we are. The identity piece to me is the big piece. Things are going to be different. Yeah. They are different right now. And yeah. we're going to have to make adjustments. If mm -hmm. it's in our church communities, if it's in um, academia, um, if it's just <laughs> going to the grocery store, um, yeah. it's just going to be different. Or going to concerts. Awesome. Things have been changing so fast that one guy says we're dealing with wavescapes rather than landscapes, okay? Mm -hmm. And so when things are changing so fast, your identity can't be what you do, okay? Because you don't know what, I mean, think some pastor had a MySpace vision <laughs> 10 years ago, you know what I'm saying? 
I don't know. Uh, I don't think it was Mark Zuckerberg's um, dream to become the infrastructure of the church. Okay, that could end tomorrow. You know, it, you know, he's he's cornered by a couple of things, but so it would be hard for him to do. But what I'm saying, I can't have a, a Facebook vision. You know, I don't know what people are going to be on in two years and three years. And so your vision can't be what you do. Your vision is who you are. You see what I'm saying? Um, Sean Wallace, am I a jazz musician, performing musician, or am I a jazz educator? You see what I'm saying? And so that's who I am. So who I am is always going to be relevant. Now, how do I do it? That's the thing that's changing. See? But once you, once you know who you are, man, I think that rest of it will fall in place. Yeah, I'm 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 hopeful and and I think oh, yeah. um yeah. um I I can't imagine a world without concerts, but it's it's tough right now to see it. Yeah, I mean I'm I'm hopeful for the future. I think there's a lot of exciting things that uh have yet to have been realized. And I think that it's uh it's likely that many of those things are being birthed right now. Yeah. We're kind of in an incubator. Yeah, and I sure think a lot are, of that stuff is 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 going to come out. Yeah, uh, I know in my own career it's caused me to. Well, first of all, I've had time to do these interviews, mm -hmm. and I would not have had time to do these. Right. right. Um, and uh, I've done some, collaborated with some other artists in ways that I had intended to do prior, but right. now time has opened up, and so we've yeah. been able to do that and. Um, and more time with family. Yeah. Um, part of the, like doing these interviews was my attempt to try to connect with folks that I hadn't maybe talked to for a while. Um, yeah. and, and even to sort of patch in certain, um, periods of time in my life, right. um, to kind of, uh, explain to myself and then also to the viewers kind of my own development in, yeah. And to introduce folks to, I think, people that have been uh, critical to my development and people right. that I respect and admire, like yourself. Well, there's people that, you know, come and then they go. You appreciate the time. But then there's also people that, they, um, it's like they leave your world, but they never leave your life. And um, you're one of those for me. You know, I really appreciate your heart for God, your heart for your craft. Uh, a little envious of your <laughs> your discipline, uh, oh. <laughs> discipline to, you know, and and you get you one of these genius guys, man. You can play anything you pick up, and um, but I think uh, you want to start praying about designing the future. I think I think we we don't want to wake up in a reality that that we don't like. You know what I'm saying? And so let's design it, man. Let's get ahead of the curve and do something that's never been done and uh, maybe even get rich while we do it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, That'd be okay. I'd, I'd be all right with that. Yeah, yeah. See, so, <laughs> I wouldn't push that off. You're a professor off. and your world has just been blown up. Okay? Yeah. So what are we going to do? You know, and and um, let's lead it. Let's lead the future. Let's think, let's think different, man. Uh, one of the things I heard the other day that I wish I had done all my life, and that was question all my assumptions. Question all my assumptions and just get down to the brass tacks. What do I need in order to do what I do? This is probably a lot less than what I've imagined, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, it's probably a lot less hoops that I have to jump through and, uh, and actually do something that solves problems, you know? So you're creative. <laughs> I love you, man. It's been good talking to you. I miss you. Yeah, I love you too, and I miss you too, man. And again, I I wanted to say thank you so much for uh, all that you've deposited into my life, and uh, you know, thanks for giving me my first full time job, <laughs> yeah, full no. benefits and insurance. <laughs> God bless you for that, and mm -hmm. uh, and thanks for um, you know being so supportive. Um, oh, man. you know, and, 
and and thanks for being the 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 man of integrity that you are because that's you, not man. that's not a uh I wish it was a common thing. Yeah. It doesn't seem I mean, like it's all that common. Yeah. Uh, uh but you've you know you've always been that way. My dad is another person that's that is that way. How's he doing? He's doing great. You know, I actually I actually interviewed him also. <laughs> That's um, great. Smart guy. Yeah, he he uh uh such an amazing just such a, an amazing guy and story and he he shared some things um that I had never heard him say. Wow. Um and my mother uh we we talked yesterday on the well, it was yesterday or the day before yesterday on the phone yeah. and and she said that he said stuff in the interview that she had never heard. You know, they've wow. been married for 50 years. They, wow. you know, th- that she had never heard. And, and apparently after the interview, my dad told me that they talked for two hours because it sparked amazing. some memories and, and things. And um, What does that mean? We don't ask enough questions, do we? <laughs> uh, well, it, it's, it's that. And also my dad is... Um, he is uh i don't know that he believes that certain things about his upbringing are valid or are appropriate to share or are are maybe things to focus on like he doesn't want people to focus on the wrong thing yeah. or the wrong aspect or to right. Right. or even to sort of uh um you know treat him like he's some great overcomer or something. Okay. Yeah. Um, he just wants to, you know, he, he, you know, he just, he, and he says this all the time. All he wanted was, uh, kids. That's all yeah. he wanted. And he didn't want his kids to have the same situation that he had. And he wow. absolutely a hundred percent accomplished that. Yeah. And then some. Yeah. Yeah. So. I always enjoy being around him. Good guy. I man, I hadn't seen him probably what, 30 years or something? It's been a while. 25 years, maybe? <laughs> uh, I what? think you're making you're making both of us a lot older than we are. Uh, let's see. So, yeah, it would have been about... Well, so I... I uh, so I... Fin- oh, so 2001, 2002. So you know, I think okay, in 2002 yeah. is when I um, moved back to Lansing. Um, okay. After, you know, after being at uh, CLC That's- for all those years. That's about eighteen, then, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's about less than I was talking. Yeah. And my dad has been retired since before I took this job in Ohio State. Yeah. Okay. He's been retired that long, and wow. um, and he was retired for like a couple of years before I even took the job, and yeah. <laughs> it's just like amazing. Yeah. Um, but you know, he does what he wants. That's cool. <laughs> that's, that's what cool. that's what it is. And you have a brother. Yeah, um, two brothers. Uh, I've got an older brother, Michael, and then a younger brother and sister. And the younger brother and sister, they're twins. And right. believe it or not, they just turned 40, which wow. makes me feel totally, <laughs> totally old. Oh, man. That's, I'm, 40, that's I'm great, 45. Though. I am 45. 40, yeah. I, I can't believe that. That doesn't even sound right because I still feel like yeah. I'm about 19. Yeah, you know what I feel, and when I'm saying feel, I meant mentally. Yeah, I feel a lot younger than I am. No, and, uh, I call myself the oldest millennial. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm the oldest millennial around. I I relate to them more than my my folks sometimes. So. Yeah, I, f- I feel that. All right, yeah, it was great talking to you, and uh, thanks yep. for your time. And uh, you know, I pray for you and your family, and I pray for. In our community, yeah, and I pray for our world. You know that we can get through this yeah. thing as uh, as quickly as possible. And uh, absolutely, man, yeah. absolutely. That's uh, we're gonna come out of this better yeah. than we went into it. And so, there's good thing. I believe there's an awakening and a revival that's gonna happen, man. That's gonna uh, sweep a lot of people into the kingdom. Well, God bless you. God bless you too, man. I'll see you later, now. All right, now. Bye-bye.